my third experience was when I had stage four lung and bone cancer. And, um, and I was, I I was terminal. They told me I only had, you know, weeks to live. And, uh, it was in my, it was in my thoracic and it, it had, well, it it was in my lungs and it had metastasized into my thoracic. It ate away two and a half bones and my spine collapsed. And it was in my, I had lesions in my hip, my brain, my kidneys. It was moving very rapidly through my body. But this is, this is after I've had my first experience, my second experience, and then many years later after integrating all of those experiences and the, and spirit communication that um, when, when the cancer came, I was kind of prepared for it. And, and not only that, but it was something that I had seen in my life review. I saw that I was going to have cancer and I saw that I was going to live beyond it. So... <clears throat> I had kind of a leg up that I knew I was going to survive it, even though the the medical community um, just wanted to give me some morphine and some Percocet and to uh, you know put my affairs in order. Welcome in. I'm Kimberly. I'm so glad you're here today. The guest we have had an experience that I just mentioned is my oh hell no (laughs) moment. It's so exciting and fun and truly, truly interesting. I'm excited that you're here for it. If you're new here, I hope you're enjoying this content. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. And if you want to keep track of what's going on in the world, but it feels a little overwhelming, you might want to sign up for our Friday morning email newsletter. The link is in the description box down below. Every Friday morning, we send out a very short, very sweet, but informative email newsletter containing all the things that we find are important going on around the planet. It's short, sweet, super free. Link is in the description box down below. I think you're going to love it. And today we're talking with near-death experiencer, David Bennett. Welcome in, David. How are you? Hi, Kim Bodie. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I am so excited to talk with you because I want to dig deep into your experience, which was about four years ago. We just determined that. And of all the experiencers I've talked to, yours was like my personal, oh, hell no. <laughs> I just don't even know if I could manage surviving through it, but you did. Why don't you go ahead and take us back to what happened to you? And then let's dive in after that and talk about how a person goes about integrating this into their life. Yeah, well, it was just a little over 40 years ago in 1983, actually March 3rd of, of uh, 83. And um, it was off the California coast. It was a, a terrible storm uh, coming into the coast. And, and we were out. I was uh, chief engineer of a research vessel, and we had just evaluated a new ROV, a remote-operated submarine. And we were, we were trying to beat the storm into the harbor, but we didn't quite make it. The harbor master refused us entry because there were 25 to 30-foot breakers at the, at the seawall. So, you know, they were afraid that our ship would would bottom out because the research vessel is a pretty large vessel. So we were, uh, we were pretty much holding station two miles off the coast, but we had a design engineer on board that needed to get into the, into the, and get him to LAX and everything. So, so the captain, we had a, a a pretty seasoned uh, mate who was willing to, you know, take a Zodiac and take him in. And we had a bunch of uh, people that were there, part of the evaluation, and they all de- decided that they wanted to go in. So I was the only one familiar with the harbor. And because of the sea state, the captain asked me um, as third officer to, uh, you know, to go in to, to take the take them in and then bring the Zodiac back out with the mate. So the mate and I were kind of going to bring the Zodiac in. And uh, we got in the Zodiac. We started heading in. But you can... Skis like that, you've got 25 foot swells. All right. So you have to, you can't see over a 25 foot swell. It's like a two story building. So um, you kind of roll up onto the top of a swell, take your bearing, and then go down the trough and, and up on top of the next swell and, and do it all over again. Well, it was really, it was this dark and stormy night, kind of like, you know, not to be. <laughs> You know, it was a dark and stormy night. And so we lost track of the harbor buoy, you know, from two miles out. So 
we just decided we're we're going to go in and do a beach landing. You know, and we'll we'll okay. get this guy. Okay, I in. wanted I want to jump in right here and ask you: Wasn't anybody saying maybe this is not a good idea? Maybe we should just wait. <laughs> No, until you the know, storm clears we're 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 all pretty seasoned you know um and and we use this uh zodiac in in to retrieve uh, our submarine and rough seas and stuff like that before so we weren't all that concerned about it and besides that most of us were adrenaline junkies anyway so um you know that didn't that didn't help uh <laughs> but we, I would imagine no, that that we, was the case. We were, I mean, we were concerned enough that this night we actually went down to the bosun's locker and we pulled out the life vests. And those life vests had been down there for a long time. And they were old World War II, May West, you know, the big orange puffy uh, pillow type uh, life vests, you know. And um, since <laughs> the Coast Guard has since banned those life vests. Um, but that's what we had, and we, we beat the dirt off them, and we actually put those on. So there was some concern, you know. We we put life vests on for, and because I, I can't remember the last time that I, I wore a life vest, you know, in the course of my job on, as on the on the research vessel, you know, back in those days. And remember, this is in the eighties, not not modern times when you you see everybody wear life vests all the time now. But back in those days, you know, guys were guys. We didn't do that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, we were a little concerned. We put the life vests on, but we lost track of the harbor, and we just decided we just we'd just fly into the beach. We'd offload these guys and and we'd head back out. But we didn't know it. The storm blew us a mile south of the harbor, and there was a breaker zone there. And we actually drove off the top of a of a wave, you know, and <laughs> actually caught some air. And uh, and I yelled at the mate, turn us around, because I realized we're right in the middle of a breaker zone, the most dangerous place to be in a, with a small boat, you know. And um, and as he turned us around, the next one was right there above us. It came down on top of us. And I was in the bow. It just catapulted me into the water. And um, and I started tumbling and tossing. Uh, I, it just it just just threw me around like a rag doll. And but I I was a commercial I've been trained as a commercial diver. Besides being the chief engineer, I was also a commercial diver. And um and so I I didn't freak out because I'd spent lots of time in the ocean and and it just was and I had a life vest on. I you know, what what's to worry, you know? It's I just have to hang on long enough for it to bring me up to the surface. Because when it got me all tumbled and tossed, I lost all orientation. I didn't know what was up, down, left, right. So I, and I was, had the where for all not to try to swim because I could be swimming down instead of up, you know. So I um, I just hung on to the Mae West and, and waited. And uh, you can only hold your breath so long. And, and unfortunately, I didn't even get a chance to hyperventilate before, you know, I went into the water. So it was just one gulp of air and and down I went, you know. So eventually, you know, the oxygen deprivation takes over. You get that euphoric feeling and um, you start thinking about things like, you know, is my life insurance paid up and things like that, you know. But then you you breathe and, and I drowned. And But it, the minute that I breathed in salt water, I popped out of my body and I found myself not so much popped out of my body, but popped out of this reality because I found myself in this absolute darkness. In, in near-death research, they call it the void. It was absolute darkness, but it was kind of an interesting place because it was quiet. It was calm. I just came from the sea that is just rolling, right? And it's loud and it's cold and it's, you know, it's ferocious. And here I'm, I'm comfortable. It's quiet. It's peaceful. And it feels like I'm really not alone. It feels like, yes, it's absolute darkness and I'm totally isolated, but I feel like everything is present at the same time. Um, it's, it's kind of a strange feeling. And so um, I was curious, like, you know, what is this? Is, this, is, this goes way beyond my diver training where they turn the air off and you're starving for air, you know? And, um, and, and, and so, you know, it's like, this is... This is something very, very strange. <laughs> and so I was in, in really, really curious. Uh, many times the people that experience this darkness, this void, um, many times they're frightened because it's, it's frightening. But I had just died this violent death. 
And so for me to be in this peaceful place, it felt very, you know, very calm, peaceful, and and I, you know, and just quiet. And and I was no longer, no longer, my body was no longer being trashed because I was outside of my body. And I was trying to figure it out. And then I saw a light and the light just drew me. And I can't, I, I to this day, I don't know if I moved toward it or if it moved toward me, but there was this motion of moving toward this light. And as I got closer to the light, the light was appeared to me as these millions of fragments of light. And the lights were all moving in unison. You know, it, it's like when you see a, a, you know, a flock of birds when they're in the fall, when they're all kind of getting ready to migrate and they all kind of swoop around and they all make a turn at the same time and this and that. Well, think of it as all these shimmering fragments of light doing the same thing, but, but with multiple colors and it was just absolutely awe-inspiring. And I kept getting closer and closer. And as I got closer, I started feeling these waves of love is all I can say. It was like a warm embrace of love that just kept supporting me and bringing me closer. And I tried to look, I actually tried to look at myself. And when I did, it kind of surprised me because um, the the way we see on the other side is not the way we see with these physical eyes. It was like uh, suddenly I, I was turned around and looking at myself and I was a fragment of light. I was one of these fragments. And as I got closer, three broke away, three fragments broke away and they welcomed me home. And that was, I mean, I've never felt anything so loving in my entire life as the love and, and support that they were, you know, sending me to be home, to be welcomed home. And eventually a dozen came and we were all together. And I was just, I mean, I was feeling pure bliss, pure joy of being in the presence of what I consider now my soul family, this family, because they felt like family to me. And then they communicated to me that we were going deeper into the light. And as we did, we went into this area that was like a giant bubble, kind of like a sphere. And in there, we started to uh, relive my life. So in NDE research, they call it the life review, but it's more than just a review. It's, it's, you get to see all of your life, but not just through your perspective, but through everyone you've ever you know interacted with, all of your interactions. And you get to feel their feelings, feel their, you know, it, it's actually like a full immersive experience to another person. But you do this and, and, and as you're doing this, it's like you're consciousness is broken into these multiple streams of consciousness and you're experiencing it in all this way. It's incredibly humbling um, to experience your life through someone else's eyes because you get to see who you really are um, and, and how people, you know, perceive you and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and, and, you know, I was a pretty brash young man at that point, because um, I had become the, I had a, I had a pretty brash philosophy. My philosophy was you cut your swath through life and you survive because I had a rough childhood where I, you know, was thrown from one family to another, to another. So I never really felt like I had a sense of family. I never felt like, you know, I belonged anywhere. And so I felt like nobody was looking out for me. So that was my philosophy was you cut your swath through life and you you survive. And so that's pretty brutal philosophy when you think about it, because it doesn't take anybody else into consideration. It's very self-involved. And so to see me interacting with people in this way, um, in this loving environment where I'm being loved and supported by my soul family, and they're experiencing it the same way I am, I actually felt there were periods in my in my life that I was ashamed that they had to experience it that way. Um, I was kind of a brutal guy, but they loved me. They supported me and we got through this. So um, it was it was incredibly humbling. But then we got to a point where it wasn't a part of my life. And I got I was a little disoriented because I didn't understand what was going on. But I was actually I know now that I was actually previewing or seeing my potential future, but it wasn't as crystal clear as the uh, life review part of my life. This preview was more like looking down a corridor 
and So then kind as you of a, a timeline experience, like almost you were seeing a potential timeline. Yeah, but it was like it was forward looking, not linear. It was really it was Okay. like looking down a corridor, but on each side, the center was was pretty clear. But off and the more you went off and in, in to the right or to the left, there was no right or left, up or down or anything like that. But once you went away from the core pathway, it would it was a little out of focus. But I got the impression that, you know, it, I could go this way if I wanted, and but I would be directed back to this center. I could go this way if I wanted, but I would be directed back. So I got to experience a few things there that I had no relationship to. But my family loved me. They supported me. We got through this. And then we reached a certain point where the light, these millions upon millions of fragments of light, all in unison, spoke at once. And they said, this is not your time. You must return. And I said, no way. There's no way I'm going back. And so I, I've got a family that loves me. I'm feeling loved and supported like I've never felt in my entire life. That body of mine is just cold and broken. And uh, there's, n I have no desire to go back to that. Life is tough. And I just, you know. And so I argued with what I perceived as God. And um, the light spoke one more time. <laughs> and it said, you must return. You have a purpose. And that word purpose just really just resonated within me. When we're not, when we're outside of our body, when we're, we're, you know, when we're not in this physical form, we have this expansiveness, this, this expansive awareness. It, I like to say that it's like all the souls that ever were and all the souls that ever will be, you have that available to you. And so when I heard purpose, it just resonated into my body. And I, and I just, with this expansive knowing, I... I understood it and it was simple. It was very simple and it was very efficient. And so I just came to acceptance. I accepted it, you know, well that, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, there was no judgment. There was no need for discernment. It was just, just, you know, I accepted it. And with that acceptance, I found myself outside my body. It was almost like a trick, you know, it's like, oh, darn. So I'm watching my body and I know I have to go back into this body and I'm curious because I'm I'm wondering how is the enormity of me going to fit in there into that body and the body was still being tumbled and tossed I had gotten caught in that um in the in the the breaker zone and so I was my body was just constantly being tumbled and tossed and the um some of the wreckage of the Zodiac ha still had a pontoon with some air in it, but the bow line had come and wrapped itself around my arm and, um, and another set of waves hit it. And when it did it, the pontoon popped up. And when it did, it cinched that line around my arm and pulled, yanked my body up, it actually dislocated my shoulder and my thumb, but I didn't feel anything. I was outside my body, just watching this, observing it. And there were three of my soul family that originally greeted me or were with me. And we were all watching as my body got yanked up to the surface. And then it got tangled up with the wreckage and the waves kept pounding the body. And when it did, some of that salt water came out of my lungs and my soul family gave me a gentle push and I just vibrated back into my body. And I'm, you know, I'm coughing up salt water and um, I'm thinking purpose, purpose. It was so clear. And now it's, it's like, it was like sand in your fingers. It was like this, it was just disappearing. And I, and I was like purpose, purpose. And and at the same time, I'm having a really hard time. Now, I'm used to being in the water, and, and I don't have trouble staying on the surface, but I feel like I'm being pulled down, pulled down. I'm having a hard time keeping my head above water. But the funny thing, when we come back, it feels like we're half here and half there. Yeah. And so I still had this expansive knowing, and I knew there was something wrong with my life vest. And I popped it open, and the, the canvas uh, shell had dry rotted, and and the fiber filling had actually saturated with salt water, and it was actually pulling me down rather than buoying me up the way it was supposed to. So I just threw it off, and then I was able to, you know, stay up. 
But my friends that were in, you know, my mates that were in the in the boat with me, they had stayed there and and one of them had hung on to a flashlight and he was sweeping the wa water and they were calling out for me. And I couldn't really yell back to him because, you know, when you when you when you, when you breathe in all that salt water, just your larynx are kind of inflamed. So I just squeaked and squawked, but they found me and, and we all rallied around the wreckage and we, we swam that last mile in, into the beach. Wow. What, a, what an experience, just both physically and metaphysically. Yeah, there was a lot. The, the, metaphysically, there were some things that haunted me for immediately right away. The the things that like, like, OK, what was supposed to save me, the life vest, actually drowned me instead of saving me. But I was saved by the bitter end of that bow line. And it just, you know, so what was supposed to save me killed me. But I was saved by the bitter end. And that just played in my mind for just a, the longest time. And um, and then, you know, you come back and you just want to like, what purpose? You know, I, so the the thing that that I really and it, and it frightened me, too, because when you come back, sometimes you have gifts, you know, not everyone, but but many experiencers receive kind of gifts, <laughs> It didn't feel like a gift to me at the time because I was an engineer. I saw things in black and white and suddenly I could see auras. Suddenly I was receiving information that came from, you know, nowhere, you know. And and then I could, when I looked into someone's eyes, I could see their light fragment. I could see their oh, essence. Wow. And that felt incredibly intrusive to me it felt like i don't have the right without your permission i don't have the right to see that you know i if you give me permission i should be able to see so so i was so conflicted i didn't know because my whole world view just got blown out of the water excuse the pun but um but i just i was i was orless i was adrift and orless i didn't know what to do you know yeah so, it was it was incredibly disorienting to know you know how do I get my life back because all of those things all the metaphysical uh, aspects you know really frightened me. Ta all right, so I'm curious. You know, you you're a young man. Yep. You're a macho dude, adrenaline junkie. Yep. Plus an <laughs> engineer, so you're very linear. So yeah. you've got this whole life. Put together with these attributes that would not necessarily easily accept the new experiences that you had. Did you remember right away? And once the memories started coming in, how on earth were you able to put it together? Because you just saw something completely different than the life you've been living. Yeah, I remembered um, right away. I remembered, you know, I remembered the the darkness to light. I remembered the feelings. I remembered the soul family greeting me and welcoming me home. I remembered glimpses of the life review. Not a lot of it at first. That took time for that recall to come back. I'm sure it was held in my cellular memory, but it took a while for it to surface. And then the um, you know the the coming back was was very very vivid. The watching my body was very very vivid memory afterwards. And and the purpose, the sense of being told that I have this purpose, you know, that and that that started the journey, I would have to say that that just that word purpose really planted a seed into my, my being that uh, you know, kind of drove my drove me. But the rest of it was very scary. I wanted my old life back. I didn't want this because I didn't know what to do with it. I'd never had any, I'd never heard of any of this stuff. Like the auras, I called it life force energies because in my mind, because I didn't know what it was, but they were amazing and beautiful. <laughs> but, but it was, it was just, uh, you know, it was like, am I going crazy? What I couldn't see this before. Is this, you know, did I, you know, did something happen, you know, that I, you know, that I, you know, did I receive a blow to the head or something that, you know, that I'm suddenly seeing things, you know, um, and I'm, and I'm, and the information I did what probably any, what good engineer would do. 
is um, I would receive this information. It wasn't anything that I'd learned in school. It wasn't anything I experienced in life. So what do you do? I would test it. Is this real? Is this veridical? Is this something that, you know, I can rely on? Is it truth? And, um, <laughs> and over the course of years, I found that it didn't even take years, really. I found right away that, you know, this information that would just come to me would just, it was, you know, it was real. So was it like a download, like you would get into an ex a situation first, or a yeah, person at first who would just it like, was just like, boom? Yes, it was. At first, it was just like this download. And sometimes it was, um, sometimes it was visionary. Sometimes it was actual um, just knowledge, you know. Um, and when it was visual, you had to interpret. That was always fun. Um, but then, you know, um, but the knowledge was, was, you know, quite alarming because it was and, it, and that the accuracy was what what astounded me so you know had that going on had the the auras and everything but the part about you know arguing with god and the soul family i didn't want to face that i really didn't i tried to push that away i really tried to push that away and i took what i felt what i was comfortable with because the life review shows you enough of yourself that you really know who you really are you get to see who you really are and i didn't like what i saw okay and so but i but i came to acceptance i could accept that this is who i am and i've got a lot of work to do but i can accept this is who i am and and i can move i can move forward you know so with, you came back with a desire to be a different type of human is that yeah very much so because um i also saw how intolerant I was of other people. I saw because of my philosophy that I learned in that life review that many people are cross our paths all the time. And they many times will make choices that maybe necessarily I won't agree with. Happens all the time. But that's their life. That's their choices for their life. And I can be tolerant that that is their choices. And so acceptance of myself, tolerance of others, and tolerance of where I find myself in life. I may not be comfortable with where I am right now, but I can work on make change. I can work on change. You know, I don't have to. It's, life is not stagnant. It's always in constant change and flux. You get to see that in in that life review. So, so why worry about, okay, I'm in a bad place right now, but I can make it better, you know. And so acceptance and tolerance. And the, the third thing that I kind of took away right away was we all have a personal truth that resonates within our heart. And when we come across this personal truth, it many times it, it, it like we feel it physically. We feel it like we, we understand and, and, and we feel that either maybe a warmth or maybe a, a tingling or something like that. But when we feel our personal truths, a lot of times those are signals. Those are like, pay attention. Is there something that, you know, maybe we need to change direction. Maybe we need to look over here or look over there, you know. So acceptance, tolerance, and truth. That kind of became my mantra for about 11 years till I had another experience, another spiritual experience. You did. Yeah, I've had Can three, hear... I've had three <laughs> near-death experiences. but You've had yeah. three? Yeah. Oh, my yeah. goodness. This is like yeah. bonus time right here. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, I wanted to, uh, before, I, I would love to hear about the other two, if, if you, you know, want to share. I, yeah, I can, share. I can just briefly, yeah. Okay, so here's the questions that I have. So you're this engineer dude guy. You're just like, you're this adrenaline, testosterone kind of person. Yep. And you have this experience that completely changes your perception of what it is we're doing here. Did you have a hard time looking around the world and thinking, this is just not really real? How do I, how do I engage in this when I know that the greater reality is so different than what the game we're playing here? Yeah. You know, Kimberly, it's, you said that perfectly, um, that the greater reality, because when we release ourselves from this physical life, we join a reality that is hyper real. It's yeah. so much more vivid, so much more expansive. We are so much more expansive. We have so much, so we have so many more abilities to us that when we come into this life, suddenly it feels confining. It feels heavy. It feels dense. And it feels more dreamlike because we don't have that expansive awareness anymore. We can touch on that, though. 
we have the ability to touch on that and to and to go into that. I've had um, I'm, I've been very fortunate that I've had some very very well known uh, experiencers as mentors that helped me through my integration uh, process, and they uh, they taught me that you can go back into the light and you can touch the light. And you can, and that helped me to kind of come to terms. In fact, after I had my uh, a second experience, I hid from it. I actually, you know, I never. Sh I sh tried to share it once with my my first wife, and it just didn't go over well. And so I, I shut it down, and I didn't share it with anyone for over eleven years, until I had the second experience. So I got really good at hiding it. I got really good at hiding those the information that was coming to me, the fact that I could, you know, uh, see and hear things. So uh, I, I was really good at hiding. But then I had the second experience, and the second experience, I got to see. I had another life review, and in that life review, I got to see the eleven years that I had lived with just taking in acceptance, tolerance, and truth, and how much it had changed me, how much it had really? softened me, and how much I started bringing more care and more loving into my life. And that was, um, and I didn't think I'd changed. I didn't really think I'd changed. But in that second experience, I got to see how just those little things, little, little ideals can make a huge impact in our life. And so acceptance, tolerance, and truth, those became my ideals. The, those, those were my guiding principles. And I would weigh everything in life against those, you know, that's and, a beautiful experience. Can I quickly ask you a question yeah. about during your first experience and you were looking at your body thinking, how am I going to, how am I going to fit into that little <laughs> thing? Because I'm so huge. And I've heard this before that we are so much more powerful than we understand. We're so much bigger than we, we can imagine. Do you ever feel like you're not entirely inside your body that there is skills and abilities and energetic connectivity that exist outside of your physical form that you can access and bring in? Yes. Excellent question, because I believe, this is my belief, that when we're in this physical form, we only carry a small percentage of our light with us. We have a connection to the greater totality of our being, but we only keep a small percentage, but we can expand and contract, you know, like I like to think of it as a pendulum. OK, in life, we we have a pendulum that swings back and forth. And on one side, we're is our human self, our, our humanness. OK, on the other side is our spiritual nature our true nature, our divine self. And so in life, the pendulum swings back and forth, you know, but but not these grand sweeps, okay? Not grand sweeps. It, it just swings back and forth just gently, you know, between our human self and our spiritual nature. And so at times, that fragment that we hold within us, our divine nature, sometimes it's, it's, it's compressed a little bit when we're dealing with our humanness. And sometimes when we um, experience when we're experiencing our spiritual nature, it, it'll expand. It'll get. It'll. It'll. It's flexible. It's able to, you know, to participate in our life as we need it. The thing is, we have to be able to recognize that and feel that, you know. So I really do believe that yes, the greater totality of our being, our divine nature, is still in the oneness, connected to the oneness, and we have a connection to that. You know, I've heard a, a lot of analogies about the golden cord, the the silver cord, the silver thread, the golden cord. Um, and I really believe that what people are experiencing there is that connection to their divine self. You know, we all have that and we all have the ability to connect with that. It takes discipline and it takes um, it takes a spiritual practice, but we can all connect with our divine nature. Now, when you say spiritual practice, are you focusing on primarily meditation, other okay. modalities. Well, for me, for me yeah. I, I think there, you know, it, there's so many ways. Meditation is a theater of different approaches. I mean, there's so many ways to meditate and so many ways to find stillness. And so I, I believe, and you know, most religions, most uh, indigenous cultures all have ways of doing that. So 
you know, I, 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 what works for one person may not work for another. So a spiritual practice, I believe, is just your way of connecting with your inner self, you know, finding that stillness. I practice a type of, uh, a type of meditation. It's called contemplative meditation. And uh, it's an old form of, of meditation. It goes way back into many spiritual teachers used to use contemplative meditation. And it's, it's more of a way where you take, you go into stillness, a, a more of a, you know, a traditional meditation. You go into quiet stillness. I start out with gratitude. I use gratitude as my, that's what quiets my mind. I go through a, a you know, a practice of, of gratitude. And then through gratitude, you can't be truly, truly grateful without letting go of the ego and letting go of, of everything and being sincere. And with that sincerity, it starts to quiet the mind. And that's for me. Now, this is my practice, but, but I use that. And then um, from that stillness, then I usually will, well, Again, it takes discipline and it evolves. Uh, meditative practice evolves throughout your lifetime. But um, I started with, then I would put a question out into the stillness. I would just put this little question out there and I would allow the universe and 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 my soul family and my higher consciousness to to focus on that point on that on that that question and then allow that contemplative environment then to to you know evolve. Now I I go into the stillness and and the point that I put out there is what what i don't put an actual question out anymore i just what is out there what do i need to hear what is it that you know so i just what is <laughs> and i allow whatever to you know to evolve and so that's part of my type of meditation it's a little more i wouldn't advise it for someone who's just trying to start out first just try to quiet the mind you know gratitude's a great tool for that using gratitude is a great tool breath exercise is another great uh, mantras you know uh, using your breath and breathe in and breathe out a mantra um Thich Nhat Hanh has some amazing breathe in breathe out kind of you know meditations and things like that that'll get you into that quiet stillness. Now you mentioned you had two additional NDEs. You kind of sort of glossed over the second one. Why do you think that you've had the two additional ones after the profound first one? I, you know, I, I deal with, uh, I talk to a lot of experiencers because, um, because I've been involved in the experiencer community for quite a while. And um, I, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for experiencers to have more than one because it's like we've opened a doorway. And so now we're more receptive to spiritually transformative experiences. They don't always have to be a near-death experience. Um, it just so happens, I guess I'm I'm kind of dense. I'm a I'm a you know, I'm a guy. I always push the envelope. And so I I guess I had to have three, but I've had a number of other spiritual experiences as well. So and the H one builds upon the next so as to, you know, and it grows in our in our ability to open up and 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 awaken, you know that sort of thing. So, yeah. so I, I I think that that's kind of the process. Is that um, many people, and not just myself. I'm trying to think. Um, PMH once told me she has had, uh, I don't know, she's had like five or something. Like that is crazy. So um, so yeah, it's um, um, I've I've been involved with uh, some retreats for near death experiencers, and we've talked about this. This is something that we we've, we've talked about. Yeah. So that it almost as if that connectivity gets reestablished and then those connections strengthen over the years, particularly if you're seeing auras, if you're getting downloads of information, do you find that if you engage in that experience, it becomes more, you, it happens more often or it's stronger? In other words, are you building that muscle? Yeah, yeah, uh, excellent analogy. Um, it is very much like exercise, where you build a muscle and you you develop your skills so that you can you can move 
beyond and and into more intricate um uh techniques the um for me it was um my third experience was when i had stage four lung and bone cancer and um and i was wow. i i was terminal they told me i only had you know weeks to live and uh, it was in my it was in my thoracic and it it had a yeah, well, it, it was in my lungs and it had metastasized into my thoracic and AOA two and a half bones and my spine collapsed. And it was in my, I had lesions in my hip, my brain, my kidneys. It was moving very rapidly through my body. But this is, this is after I've had my first experience, my second experience. And then many years later, after integrating all of those experiences and the, and spirit communication that um, when, when the cancer came, I was kind of prepared for it. And, and not only that, but it was something that I had seen in my life review. I saw that I was going to have cancer and I saw that I was going to live beyond it. So <clears throat> I had kind of a leg up that I knew I was going to survive it, even though the the medical community um, just wanted to give me some morphine and some Percocet and to uh, you know put my affairs in order. But I said, no, or if I can say no to God, I can say no to anybody. Um, you can and, say no to a, you know, a doctor. That's, sure, a, sure. that's a piece of cake after that. Piece of cake. He's not God. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> so I, um, so um, using my spirit communication, we, I decided to, you know, to treat it because my guidance told me to use medical and metaphysical, uh, medical and holistic uh, approaches. And, um, and, and, but in that process, I learned when we pay attention to, our guidance. You know, a lot of times we really just don't listen to our guidance. We just, because we're so caught up in the circumstances, you know, and, but when, when we allow ourselves to, um, to take a deep breath, anytime that we're caught up in the circumstances, if we just stop for a minute, take a deep breath, it allows us a little bit of a uh, higher awareness. It elevates our awareness just a little bit to where we can rise above the circumstances and we can, you know, have clearer vision. And so that's the one thing that the cancer and, and all of the suffering that goes with a collapsed spine did for me is it helped me to go back into a higher level of awareness. And from there, I was able to discern what were the better treatment options for me? Yeah, because it felt right. Because it felt right, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and we all have those experiences. There are times when maybe we uh, drink something and we're like, oh, I needed that. That's exactly what my body needed. You know that feeling. We know that feeling because we have this intrinsic knowledge that is available to us. It tells us what's right and what's wrong. We all know what's right and wrong. And the same thing when we eat something and we go, oh, that, uh, that's, I shouldn't have eaten that. It just, mm -hmm. that's not good for me. It's not good for my body. It's not good for my wholeness. So, I mean, we all have that ability, but we just, we ignore it a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I think it happens, or based on my experience, it seems to happen more in how oh, Western cultures, when you start looking at more indigenous cultures mm -hmm. that don't have this reliance on critical thinking. Right. They are more in touch with their, their spiritual life, with their humanity, and they can really feel their way through challenges that we have kind of lost that connection, particularly I think in the U S because yeah. it's not, it's not promoted when you're a young child, you, you, you feel these things innately and it gets shut down. Yeah, when I was younger and um, my mom had kind of dragged us out to Arizona, I had I was very fortunate. Um, my family was really dysfunctional at that point. They were just, and so I, I spent my life trying to escape from them. Um, but my friends were mostly native, native, and and um, and their grandmothers saw the dysfunction in my life, and they kind of took me aside and and kind of taught me a little bit of the natural way of, uh, you know, which is, you know, an indigenous uh, philosophy, basically, or the, an indigenous of, of, you know, living within, and it's also very stoic, which is kind of, which I found kind of interesting, but um, it's, uh, you know, living with what's around you and paying attention and being aware of your surroundings and looking for the messages that are there. 
And um, and they sent me on my first vision quest to, you know, and this is before, way before my near-death experience and stuff like this. This is when I was 14, you know. I actually had a, a vision quest where I met uh, Grandfather Mountain and, uh, and he, you know, but... And that was a great thing. So after I had my near-death experience, I, I remembered that experience of being 14 and having that. And I was like, you know, that is more in tune or in line with what I experienced. In the, and so when I came back, with, and this happens to most experiencers that I've talked to, is you start searching for things in life that will bring you closer to what you experienced on the other side, you know. Yeah, boy, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. You must seek it out. You do. And many of us become voracious readers, you know, like I was looking for anything that had love in the title. If you looked at my library, you would uh, you would see there's a ton of books about love, <laughs> but the answer isn't in the books. That's unfortunate. But it, it yeah, we become searchers, uh, you know, we become, we, we're trying to, I like to say, you know, we've had the experience and it kind of split us. It, we we see that our human side and our spiritual side. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring it all back together so that we're back in wholeness, back in unity. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of the journey of integration with any spiritual experience, I believe. There was once a Pew uh, research, I think in, in um, 2004, that uh, asked the question of U.S. American adults um, about if they've had a spiritual experience. And over, it was 57.4%, I think, was, was of American adults have had some form of spiritual experience. And you think about it, that's over half of the U.S. adults, all right, have had some form of spiritual experience. But there's no process for us. There's no process to yeah. integrate it. There's no, there's no infrastructure to deal with it. Right. There's, there's no support for it either. There's no social support. None, none, you know, I mean, and, and if you try to take it, I, I have a number of experiencers that have tried to take their experience to their religious leaders and they've been <laughs> ostracized. I, I, and it astounds me, you know, it, it just, if I'm just floored by that, 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 you know, and so, so many times um, people that have had some form of spiritually transformative experience are, are left alone to find their own path, to find their own answers. Yeah. But nowadays with, um, you know, with internet, there's more, more available. There's many communities online that you can tap into. Um, there's programs like what you're doing here, Kimberly, that, that helps, you know, Bring the message out to the to everybody. You know, you don't have to be alone. I felt alone for 11 years, and I don't want other experiencers to feel that way. So I'm an advocate for experiencers to, you know, to integrate their experience. Yeah. Do you think that this is the direction that humanity is going, integrating both the, the broader spiritual reality of what we are into this human form? I just, I ask because it seems like, we're just in this sea change on earth right now. I mean, things yeah, are Yeah, just... you look around and you look around at, at everything that's coming at us right now and you would say no. But I feel the opposite. Um, yeah. The communication, because I talk to a lot of people and a lot of people reach out to me. And the message is, or the feeling that I get overall, just, you know, summarizing, is that you know, people are looking for their spiritual nature. They're, they are. And so I believe that it's just below its subsurface and it's percolating up. You know, I think because there's a lot you can find, you can find what you're looking for a lot easier now than you could back in 83 when I had my experience. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot easier to find community um, even though it may not be community, you know, there are, there are a lot of pockets even here in the United States and all around the world where, um, where you, you know, you, you feel isolated, you're going to feel isolated because you, you know, but I guarantee there are other people within that community that are in the same boat that you are. And, but there are also areas, you know, because there's a lot of turmoil when in the world and when we're in a like in a war zone or when we're in, you know, uh, a very dire straits, we're in survival mode. And when we're in survival mode, we don't really have the ability 
to focus deeper. Um, we're just, we're, we're cut off sometimes when we're in that, but there's usually purpose behind that, that we don't see, we just can't see, but, but we have to recognize that many people in, in a dire situation are in survival mode and they're having a difficult time. It takes a lot more focus for them to connect with their divine nature when they're in survival mode. It just takes so much more energy. It's that many times people just, I mean, that's not where they're going to focus, you know? Yeah. And it's, um, I just feel like we're, there is such a interest now in connecting back to earth to connecting to our true passions, who are we really? What really works for us? Is this how we want to spend our lives? Things are just shifting about how people want to experience this human life that we have. Yeah. And that's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. Um, even if you're just starting on the path, you know, to be able to uh, experience beauty, to be able to, I mean, really experience beauty, you know, I mean, and and to because when we when we distill it down, love and beauty, kindness, compassion, gratitude, those are the ideals. Those are the ideals that we want to strive for. You know, Edgar Casey, um, I live in Virginia Beach, so Edgar Casey is a big deal here. Um, but Edgar Casey, you know, he 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 espoused that we should all establish an ideal. You know, that guiding star, that guiding principle. It may not be something that you can achieve in life, but it's it's what you use as your, you know, your your focus. Uh, that we all should should establish some ideals. And as we do that, we evolve. You know, it's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful you put that so beautifully. David, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fascinating. Oh. And I would imagine the doctors are baffled. <laughs> Ah, they say, I don't know what you're doing, but keep it up. <laughs> keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, how can we find out more about you? Well, um, I have a website, uh, dharmatalks.com. I also have a, um, a YouTube channel where I, on every uh, Sunday morning, I do a little 15 minute um, uh, podcast uh, called Contemplative Living. And so if you search David Bennett Contemplative Living, or um, I think the actual YouTube channel is Dave's Dharma Talks. Um, and my website is dharmatalks.com. So Wonderful. it's pretty easy. And and from there, if you're interested in interacting social media wise or anything like that, um, there are links on my website. You know. Wonderful. And we'll have all of that listed in the description box down below. Super easy to connect with David and find out more. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much for inviting me, Kimberly. This has been fun. Oh, it has been fun. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Coming up next, this is a good one. Or you might really like this one, too. Either one of them could be perfect for you. Before you leave, don't forget to subscribe.